When the Occupy Wall Street camp sprung up in Zuccotti Park in the fall of 2011, it inspired activists from all around the world to set up similar camps in their own cities. In my home city of Madison, Wisconsin, the camp was a place where everyone from free marketers to socialists could share ideas and discuss how to fix our broken economic and political systems. But meanwhile, as we continued to hold our meetings, the population of the camp continued to grow. Just like in other cities across the U.S., homeless people were coming to the camp at an increasing rate, drawn by the resources, the camaraderie, and the security that the camp provided. At first, we welcomed them, but soon it began to feel, at least to some of us, like an invasion. Many of them seemed to have no interest in participating in the maintenance of the camp, but they had no problem helping themselves to free food and supplies. We started referring to them as crashers. And predictably, as the vibrant political salon became a chaotic refugee camp, Occupy Madison began to experience a mass exodus of activists. And as the cold months of winter arrived, we couldn't help noticing, especially the homeless couldn't help noticing that most of the remaining activists weren't spending their nights at the camp, but in the warmth of their homes, you know, not in a parking lot, in a, in a frozen tent. Uh, the homeless felt they were the ones doing the real occupying, and they started referring to us as housies. <laughs> Some of us on both sides tried to make peace, but the resentments ran deep. To give you an example, at one point, an unemployed homeless construction worker stormed into the large hoop house that we used as our, our central meeting room. He, he reached into his pocket, pulled out a handful of screws, and he whipped them into the center of the room onto the floor and just yelled, screw you. I, I can't blame the activists that quit at this point because it, it's nearly impossible to have any kind of a productive meeting in that kind of chaos. I mean, no one signed up to be verbally abused. But these kinds of incidents were beginning to communicate one thing very clearly. People were in real emotional pain. An abstract political theory wasn't going to heal them. By this time, those who couldn't let go of their pure ideologies had to let go of Occupy Madison. The Occupy movement for them had proven to be yet another false alarm for a revolution that wasn't going to happen. Each of us had come to Occupy Madison with our own preconceptions of how to move forward, and because of this, we were at a standstill. We had resented many of the homeless for not participating. But some of us were beginning to realize that we were expecting them to meet us entirely on our terms. For those of us in this room who come from a culture of business or academia, it's, it's easy to take for granted all of the assumed rules of communication in a business or academic meeting. You know, a specific agenda, you know, staying on topic, concise speech, time limits. Some homeless people are familiar with these uh, rules, but many are not. I want you to consider yourself in the following situation. Imagine you live on the streets. No one wants to hire you. No one wants to rent to you. People walk past you every day and they don't make eye contact. You're, you're invisible. You don't exist. And, and you try to keep your dignity, but in the back of your mind, this adds up and you can't help but think that maybe you aren't as worthy as those people who keep ignoring you every day. And, and then suddenly you find yourself in a, in a meeting room with these people and they're saying, join in, speak your mind. And now you're very visible and everyone can see that you haven't had a shower in days and everyone sees your dirty clothes, and you're 
afraid that you're not going to be as articulate as the person who just spoke before you sitting next to you. And you finally work up the courage to speak. And someone says, I'm sorry, you're, you're off topic. That's, that's not on our agenda. Why would you ever put yourself in that situation? So we relaxed our rules, and, and we let the meetings become much more flexible. And we accepted the fact that the daily and nightly conversations around the fire barrel were every bit as important as the formal meetings, and we began to have real dialogue. We even had a small ceremony where we wrote the words Crasher and Housey on cards and burned them. I have many fond memories from this time uh, of Jen bringing hot coffee to the camp every morning at 5 a.m. before she went to work, of Will, whose resounding voice never needed a microphone, uh, of Dennis, a charismatic but troubled combat veteran of the Iraq War, searching for peace and all the wonderful midnight conversations I had with Royston and, and so many others. I can't say everything was fine after that because much, much of the chaos and conflict never went away. But we learned to see each other's humanity across class lines. And for the first time in the history of Madison, homeless people had become an organized political force to be reckoned with. In April of 2012, when Madison Mayor Paul Soglin ordered the dismantling of the camp, Several dozen homeless members of Occupy Madison attended a city council meeting to petition their government. And one after another, they told their stories. And the city alders had never seen anything like this before. But the camp did come to an end, and everyone naturally assumed that would be the end of Occupy Madison. But we simply couldn't let our story end here, because some of us, like me, could just go back to our houses, but uh, most of us had nowhere to go. So we stayed together, and we kept meeting, moving from one public land to another, always told we were breaking the law. But of course, we already knew that, because in Madison, there is no legal place to go if you're homeless. After a person's allotted 60 to 90 days in the shelter are used up, the very act of sleeping becomes a crime. So we took the fight back to the city and county by camping on the lawn of the Dane County Department of Human Services. The county's ultimate response was to raid the camp, separate everyone from their personal belongings, transport everyone several miles out of town to Token Creek Park, where they would spend the entire winter. And whether it was intended or not, the effect was to cut off the homeless members of Occupy Madison from the housed members who had to attend to their jobs and lives in town. We were often told that the answer was to get permission to camp on private land. And eventually this happened when a local attorney named Kwa Vang allowed us to set up tents on his land. But this didn't solve anything because the city threatened him with an $11,000 fine if we didn't leave. Mr. Vang courageously resisted, saying that for many years as a homeless Hmong refugee before arriving in America, he had been given sanctuary by kind landowners many times, and he could not in good conscience turn away internally displaced refugees. After exhausting every existing option, we were forced to realize the city and county could not be expected to find a housing solution for us. We were going to have to create our own housing. And in the time I have here today, I could not hope to tell you the whole story. But we brainstormed. We attended countless meetings with each other, with neighbors, with city officials. We hammered and sawed and painted, and finally we built our first tiny house and we took it on the road to rally support and raise funds. But building tiny houses wasn't enough because we still had no place to put them. For a year, we had to move that first house every 48 hours. And despite now having shelter, the couple living in it was still on the street, vulnerable and exposed. Everything changed in the summer of 2014 when we were able to buy a dilapidated auto repair shop at the west entrance of the Emerson East neighborhood. The people of Emerson East are great. They're very friendly. But some of them were legitimately concerned that an influx of formerly homeless people might bring noise and litter and police calls. We wanted to be neighbors, 
not invaders. So with the help of our city alder, Larry Palm, we set up a series of public meetings to address these issues and support grew. The fact that our tiny house village would be in a residential neighborhood was actually a key part of our model. We rejected the idea that a community of formerly homeless people had to be placed on an isolated plot of land at the edge of town. Our experience taught us that segregation and isolation of people just promotes more hopelessness. Addiction, depression, petty crime. People have a much better chance of thriving when they're a part of society and not excluded from it. In a matter of months, ongoing negotiations with the city saw us go from being blocked by seemingly insurmountable zoning laws to a vote of unanimous approval from the Madison Common Council. And so we began construction, and the result was OM Village, a self-governed community comprising tiny houses built by and for form people formerly in need of safe, stable housing, a workshop for building those houses, a retail store, gardens, and even beehives. OM Village is an experiment. It's a work in progress. Its future is not guaranteed. It will succeed only to the extent that we work to make it succeed. We get emails from everywhere from people who want to create a tiny house village where they live. And the truth is, we really are still figuring things out for ourselves. But we're happy to share what we learn along the way with anyone who wants to find out about it. Uh, we're not utopian. We, we know that this is not the complete solution to homelessness. But there are people in every city and county in the US for whom a tiny house could be a safe, stable home. And why should anyone live like this when they can live like this? Thank you.